The gospel today is from Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends the reading. Take up your cross and follow me. We've heard that invitation so often in the church that it's lost its bite. For us, the cross is a shiny brass or silver ornament or something we hang around our neck. The invitation to follow often degrades into just a call for regular church attendance or being nice to the neighbor and the cat. It's difficult for us to see this command of Jesus with the eyes of his disciples. For them, the cross amounted to a firing squad. It's hard to hear these words with the ears of the early Christians who heard it read in house churches in 2nd century Uh, Roman cities. For them, the invitation to follow was an invitation to sedition against the state and blasphemy against the emperor. It was treason that could lead to execution. It's difficult for us to hear it in those ways because it's 2012 in the United States. Our government does not jail or kill us for being Christian. Christians are the majority in society among our le- in our, among our elected leadership. We are not a persecuted minority. Unlike first century Christians, we don't join a church expecting that with a baptismal certificate comes a constant worry that we will be ratted out by the neighbors to the local military authorities. But we need to remember that our experience as Americans is not shared even today by all Christians. Today, whether it's in North Korea or Pakistan, the Sudan, uh, increasingly in Egypt and Iraq, it can cost in brutally concrete ways to accept the invitation to follow Jesus. Even today, there are many places where a Christian should take dead seriously The words, follow me. It's only smart to know what you're getting into. But we are comfortable Christians living in a society in which we assume we'll be done in by cancer at 75 rather than a bullet or a bomb at 30. So the question is, what does it mean for us to follow him and to follow him here in this place? Now, let me be clear that the cross is not a burden 
forced on us or suffered by circumstance. Our cross is not disobedient children, nagging parents, or persisting ailments. That's usually what we mean when we say we all have our cross to bear. That's not what Jesus meant. The cross of Christ is the cross that we choose. And we choose it when we make another's sufferings our own suffering. That's what Jesus did. His invitation to follow is an invitation to do the same. So we take up our cross when the suffering of the Sudanese, Muslim or Christian, becomes ours. We take up our cross when the fear and the loneliness of an old woman living in a nearly empty, cold apartment becomes ours. We have taken up our cross when the message of the gospel to places that are hostile to us. Now, does that make sense? Well, no, not really. It's just human nature not to take on more suffering than we have already been handed. We do say we have our own crosses to bear. We can't take on the troubles of others. Lord knows there's some truth in that. Who in their right mind takes on suffering that doesn't belong to them? But Jesus is clear in today's gospel, and it's hard to wiggle out of. If anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves Take up their cross and follow me. Deny yourself, Jesus says. Forget yourselves. Lose yourself in the service of another. I'm not even sure Oprah's relationship experts would call that a healthy thing to do. The most basic human drive is to preserve ourselves, to look after number one, to survive. Altruism was okay, but only to the extent that it brings us fulfillment and brings us happiness. But Jesus says, deny yourself. Lose yourself. Let yourself be supplanted. And that would be impossible, but for one thing. Remember this. God in Christ has already given us the one thing that we are so afraid of losing, that is our lives. As baptized Christians, our very lives are held secure in God. The baptismal covenant is one that God will not break. His sign on us is indelible. I have a Lutheran colleague who wants made that reality unintentionally clear. As a young pastor, he was enamored of what we call the smells and bells of high church worship. And he decided to put a traditional spice or oil in the anointing oil that Lutherans use for baptism. Now, the first time he was to use it, there were several babies in a line uh, about to be baptized And he put the smelly oil on their foreheads and said to each one down the row, you have been marked with the cross of Christ forever. When the baptism was over, he noticed that the parents of one of the infants uh, were looking at their infant with some mild alarm. And the baby had this bright pink welt on his forehead exactly in the shape of a cross. And the pastor thought, what have I done? I have scarred this child forever. The poor thing had had an allergic reaction to the spice in the oil. And so they rubbed the oil off, but the welt remained. For a few days as an angry welt, and then for days more as a scaly cross-shaped patch on his forehead. The poor pastor thought he had damaged that child forever. Well, it wasn't really forever but it lasted a little too long for comfort. Now that baby is probably in his late 20s now, and that story about the cross-shaped welt on his forehead is no doubt still being shared in that family just as I'm sharing it with you today. 
If ever a baptism made in a permanent impression, it was that one. And yet it's also a reminder that the promise that goes with that cross is not just an empty gesture. It is real and persistent, never to be withdrawn. It is a promise that our lives will always, always be secure in God. We don't need to struggle for that promise. We don't need to fear losing it. We are loved by God, and that will never change. And it's only when we know this and know it in as deep a place as our fear and our insecurity, only then can we risk losing ourselves in the pain and the struggle of others for the sake of the gospel. We can forget ourselves and let God's gifts flow right on through us to soothe the pain and suffering of others. Now, I think that Jesus is speaking powerfully to congregations as well as to individual disciples. One of my persistent concerns about churches, especially churches that I work with, is the temptation to fall into a pattern of worry or anxiety about the future of the congregation. How can we increase our membership? How can we possibly survive if whatever trend continues? What would be the questions you would ask if you truly listened to Jesus in today's gospel? He says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Your survival as a church is not your concern. Besides, survival makes for a lousy mission statement. What is your, con- what is your concern is figuring out what it means for you to take up the cross of Christ in Winston-Salem in the next five or ten years. It might well be a mission statement to say, filled with the promise of life forever in Jesus Christ, we will bear his cross into the world, joining with those who suffer the burdens that they cannot bear alone, sharing ourselves and our sure hope in Christ. Your future lies not in survival or even concern about it, but in determining together how you will bear the cross into this community and the world for Christ's sake. I confess to you that I have a 30-year-long habit of referring as a sort of visual aid to a large central cross in whatever Lutheran or Episcopal church I have preached in. And you can see I've been a little frustrated here at home church (laughs) as I almost automatically fling my arm out to refer to empty space. There is no central cross. You don't have a big central cross sitting on or hanging over the altar or slapped against a reredos. That's the big covering in the back. Look it up. I came in here yesterday, and I counted. You actually have eight crosses. They are all in the windows, except for this little one here in front of the baptismal font. And when I realized that, I I have asked in the last couple of weeks, as a Lenten sort of discipline, I've asked folks who should know about the paucity of crosses in Moravian churches. First, about half of the churches in the province do have some kind of central cross, but many, including home church, do not. Now, as a Lutheran, where we are pleased to provide theological support for the most piddling of practices, I was disappointed at the lack of theological sophistication in the answer I received about my question about lack of Moravian crosses. Basically, the reason that there are many Moravian churches without crosses is that Moravians historically met for worship in the Saul, which is a common or community room used for many other gatherings. Also, Moravians had a love 
for simplicity and little love for accoutrements, liturgical or otherwise. In other words, as to big fancy crosses, we didn't really need one, and they got in the way. Well, I've been, going, I've been here going on two years, so I get that. I, I really do. I get that perspective. But this morning, let's add another reason that there is not a cross here that I can point to in a sermon. We can do that. We can shape our own story. Let's say that the reason there is no cross up here is that we take it with us. Here in this place, we experience the cross in word and sacrament, in song and fellowship, and then we take it up and out the doors. Each of us bears the cross when we leave and re-enter life in our own piece of the world. And there, day in and day out, we look to give ourselves away. Sometimes to die a little for the sake of another and ultimately for Christ himself. When we do that, we also bear the hope of the life that is life in Christ. Amen.